Hello, and thank you for joining Certificates of Veterinary Inspection, What Accredited Veterinarians Need to Know, featuring Dr. Stacy Schwabenlander. My name is Nicole Kast, CE Program Manager for the MVMA, and I'm pleased to be today's moderator. If you have any questions during the session, please type them in the chat area, and they'll be answered either uh, as Stacy sees fit or at the end of the session, depending on where she's at in the presentation. Um, if you're not certain where the chat box is, it's up in the upper right-hand corner of your WebEx screen. If you'll just click on chat, the box will show up for you if it isn't there already. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's Lunch and Learn speaker. Dr. Schwabenlander graduated from the University of Minnesota's College of Veterinary Medicine and School of Public Health in 2007. She spent two years in private practice in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And she's been working at the Minnesota Board of Animal Health since 2010 and is currently overseeing the Import Expert Division and working to advance animal disease traceability. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Schwabenlander. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. All right, guys, we are going to talk about health certificates today, um, more specifically certificates of veterinary inspection and outline a little bit of information that you guys might find helpful when you're issuing these documents. There seems to be a lot of confusion, I guess, that we see. So I'm hoping to try to go through some of the different points of concern that we typically get questions on, as well as give you guys some updates about what's happening with CVIs here in Minnesota and some maybe helpful tools to make it all easier for you. So here is the agenda. We'll go through some of the basics as well as covering some of the required fields to make it a little bit more transparent about what not only Minnesota but what state of states of destination are looking for as well when health certificates are issued. And we'll go through what the options are. Um, only official CBI can be used when moving animals interstate. So I'll outline the options that are available for you. We'll also talk about the APHIS Form 7001. Uh, we get a lot of questions on that, and there's recently been some articles put out in reference to that document, which is a federal form, so I will cover that as well. And then I'll touch base on CVI addendums, which are most commonly helpful for large animal practitioners, and we'll also outline how you get a hold of some of these documents. And as Nicole mentioned, if, if you do have questions along the way, feel free to go ahead and let me know. Uh, if you don't ask right away, feel free to jot it down if you want to wait till the end, but I'm comfortable with you guys asking questions as we go along if something on a particular slide catches your interest and if you want to follow up right away. Don't hesitate. All right, so as I mentioned previously, CVIs are Certificates of Veterinary Inspection, and whenever you're moving animals, either interstate or intrastate within the state of Minnesota, if you would elect for whatever reason to issue a CVI for that purpose, official forms must be used. This commonly comes up because we'll have people who say that they have specific clinic software that can issue a health certificate or has some sort of generic CVI or health certificate form. And those documents would actually need to be approved as official for use to move animals interstate. So the state of Minnesota needs to authorize the use of any CVI to be considered official. So that's just kind of an FYI. We do have a few clinics that do have specific software that is used in their clinic that has been approved, and those documents are issued unique CVI numbers to utilize in order for other states to know that they have been approved. So if you have questions on that, you can definitely touch base with me on that, but official forms do need to be used. And CVIs are also only available to Minnesota accredited veterinarians, which means that if you are a veterinarian who has become licensed but have not yet been accredited through the United States Department of Agriculture, then you would not be able to issue CVIs. Similarly, you also wouldn't be able to do any TB testing, brucellosis testing or vaccination, or any duties that fall under what would be required for um, accreditation. 
If you are not accredited and have questions on that, definitely touch base with me later or you could email me directly as well so we can get you accredited. But you would need to be accredited to issue any CVI. And there's two different categories for that. So if you're a Category 1 accredited veterinarian, that means you can issue health certificates for small animals as well as some of the other animals that are listed on the screen here. So dogs, cats, lab animals, um, miscellaneous pocket pets, things like that. You would not be able to issue a health certificate, for example, for a pet bird that came into your clinic. Birds fall under Category 2. So in order to issue health certificates for large animals, birds, or to be able to issue health certificates for any animal at all, you would want to be a Category 2 accredited veterinarian. The difference mainly is there's going to be additional CE required to be Category 2 as opposed to Category 1 through USDA. All right, so some of the basics. Uh, the paper CVIs, when those are ordered from our office, and they're only available through our office, they're currently in a four-part form, and you can get those either by calling our office or by submitting a form online, and I'll show you guys where that is later. But any time paper health certificates are requested from our office, we do require the name of an accredited veterinarian in order to process that order. That doesn't mean only that veterinarian can issue those CVIs, but we do need to verify that an accredited veterinarian has knowledge of the order and will be receiving those CVIs in their clinic so that we can be certain that veterinarians that are not accredited are not ordering the CVIs. And then those documents are actually associated to the clinic itself in our database. So each of the CVIs has a unique CVI number, and that's traceable back to your clinic. So in the event that we have a CVI that we would receive, and if there's any concerns that it was perhaps issued fraudulently by um, a producer or anything like that, we would be able to trace that CVI number back to the clinic to try to figure out where um, something would have gone wrong with that situation. Any CVI that's issued has to have animals on it that have been inspected specifically by the veterinarian that's issuing the CVI. So if someone else in your clinic inspected the animals, you would not be able to issue that CVI. They would have to issue it themselves. So the implication of any animals on that document are that the issuing veterinarian did the inspection and any tests associated with that. Now, if an animal was vaccinated by someone else in the clinic, that is not a problem. Any veterinarian who is able to interpret that record, that health record for the animal, would be able to attest to the fact that they're vaccinated as appropriate if required by the state of destination. But the actual examination or inspection of the animals would need to be performed by the issuing veterinarian. The Veterinarian also needs to attest that the animals on that document meet all state and federal movement requirements. All requirements in general are set by the state of destination when you're moving animals between states. So when exporting from Minnesota and moving animals to South Dakota, South Dakota would make the decision about what requirements need to be met. If you're moving livestock, a helpful tool for that is the website interstatelivestock.com, and that website 24-7 is available and will list import requirements for cattle, swine, sheep, goats, um, and horses. So you would be able to enter the state of origin as Minnesota, enter the state of destination, and then there in their interface would actually allow you to go through asking you various questions and then it'll get down to the end where it'll tell you specifically what the import requirements are. So if you're working after hours or on a weekend when the state of destination is not available, that can be a helpful tool. Again, that's specifically for livestock and horses. So small animal requirements would not be on that website. You can also check the state of destination's website, which 
is always as up to date as the state of destination keeps it, unfortunately, but hopefully most of the states do. Otherwise, calling the state animal health officials at the appropriate agency would be another way to verify that animals meeting are meeting the import requirements. Various states have various requirements from CVIs, official identification, import permits. Some states will have specific testing or vaccine requirements, and some states may even have vaccines that need to be given in a specific time period before the animal enters. So there can be a multitude of different requirements, so it's always good to call to verify what those requirements are as they can change readily based on disease situations throughout the country, states can change their requirements. So it's, it's good to be aware of what those requirements are. CBIs must be issued within 10 days of inspection. Now this is a fairly static rule. There's one exception to this. In situations where veterinarians have a regular herd health maintenance program with their client, they can actually issue health certificates up to 30 days from the date the animals are inspected. And what that basically means is, or where that comes into play, is most commonly we will see that with swine veterinarians. Um, there are some cattle veterinarians as well that might fall into this. But the CFR, the citation that's listed on the slide, outlines how this regular herd health maintenance program would need to occur. And it basically means there's a veterinarian on the property of the producer or the animal owners every 30 days inspecting all animals on the property every 30 days. And in those situations where this agreement is in place between the accredited veterinarian and the animal owner, then they can issue health certificates up to 30 days from the date the animals were last looked at. Unless that is in place, all health certificates would have to be issued within 10 days of inspection. So that's something to keep in the back of your head. Uh, most commonly, most health certificates we get are issued the same day the animals are inspected, but every once in a while we'll have a situation where a client will have gone into their veterinarian and their animal was examined, and then two weeks later they decide that they want to fly to California and they want the veterinarian to issue a health certificate. So in that situation, the client would actually have to schedule another exam to come back in for the animal to be examined again, since two weeks ago is outside the 10-day requirement for when the health certificate would have to be issued. And I mentioned that already that the health certificate has to be issued by an accredited veterinarian. And the reason I want to reiterate that is we've had more questions come up on that since more and more accredited veterinarians have been looking into the electronic CVI options. So in situations where you have the paper CVI, if you have clinic staff, whether that be someone behind the receptionist desk, a CVT, uh, or anyone else, a veterinary assistant, anyone within your clinic, they would be able to assist by completing a paper CVI by filling in the origin and destination information, animal information, all kinds of fields on the CVI. The veterinarian signature itself is the field that only the veterinarian can complete. So the accredited veterinarian has to sign or issue that CVI, but staff can assist with completion. When it comes to electronic CVIs, if the electronic CVI being used has a way for staff to assist with completion, where they do not need the veterinarian specific login credentials, they would also be able to help complete that. However, there are some eCVIs where only the veterinarian has an account. And in those situations, there is not a way for clinic staff to help complete those since they would have to share their login credentials. And the login credentials act as the veterinarian's digital signature 
which is why that information cannot be shared. So that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at eCVI options and how things are set up in your clinic. You just need to be aware that only the accredited veterinarian can have the credentials or do the issuing of a CVI, whether that be electronic or on paper. The CVI is then valid for 30 days from the inspection date, not the issue date. So 30 days from the date the animal was inspected. However, there might be some states of destination or potential carriers such as airlines, which may require the CVI to be issued within a certain period. So for example, an airline might require that the CVI be issued within five days and they say it's only good for that five days or, or whatever the airline may wish to, choose, to do. Unfortunately, airlines can set their own requirements that can be more strict than what the state sets. So it's always good to be aware that when you're dealing with certain carriers to make sure that they don't have more strict requirements than you would otherwise have to follow. And then CVIs need to all be submitted to the Board of Animal Health within seven days for all livestock. This is actually a federal rule that requires the seven days. The exception are small animals. So in state rule, health certificates need to be submitted in 14 days. However, for livestock, they're covered under the federal animal disease traceability rules, which is why they have to be submitted within seven. On our health certificates along the bottom, on the paper health certificates, you may notice that it says that they need to be coming in every seven days. And that is there to make it easier for people to remember to submit them once a week. But if you're small animal exclusive, you should know that technically the health certificates can be sent in every 14 days. CVIs must be legible. I realize this probably seems like a silly comment to make, but we do get quite a few health certificates that are not legible. And in order for them to do what they need to be doing, we do have to be able to read them. They are all legal documents, which again goes to the fact that the accredited veterinarian will want to review the information on the document that's captured before they sign it or issue it. An unissued or incomplete CVI should never be given to a animal owner to complete after it's been signed. It needs to be completed before it is signed to ensure that the veterinarian is signing off on accurate information and that all state and federal movement requirements have been met. If you give out an unsigned or an incomplete CVI, on occasion, someone else can complete the CVI for you and may not be the information that you would have expected to be on there. So we wanna make sure that you're aware not to give out any unissued or unsigned documents. And also you don't wanna leave required fields blank, again, because someone else might fill that in for you and it might be information that you wouldn't have expected to be on there. And also CVIs, as I mentioned, are accountable and they all are traced back to a physical clinic premises. So you do wanna make sure you know where the CVIs are at, that they can't be easily accessed by someone um, that, it, that you don't trust in the clinic to make sure that they're kept secure. So I'm gonna go through some of the fields really quickly here. This image that you're looking at right now is the most recent version of our Certificate of Veterinary Inspection, the paper form. This is a four-part form. You'll see on the bottom the highlighted piece that I mentioned earlier about the CVI copies coming into the office here in St. Paul every seven days. Again, small animals technically are every 14 days but sometimes it's easiest to have a routine in the clinic to submit everything once a week just to make it clear and easy to follow and not have to recall every two weeks. And you can see all of the fields are, are highlighted here and, and outlined. And I did send Nicole our CVI cheat sheet 
And the image you're looking at is a piece of that CVI cheat sheet, which outlines all of the fields. And there's a couple of things I want to make sure and highlight where we will get a lot of questions from veterinarians, and we will also get a lot of CVIs that have been disapproved by the state of destination based on some of these concerns. So I want to make sure and outline those for you. First off, it says there must be a Minnesota physical address on the left-hand side of the CVI for the origin of the animal. We will oftentimes get health certificates where there is no Minnesota address on there. And if there's no Minnesota address, it would imply that the animal should not be on a Minnesota Certificate of Veterinary Inspection. So we need to make sure that the Minnesota CVI always is used for Minnesota animals in Minnesota. This most commonly is an issue with border states or with clients that are traveling with pets. So the Minnesota CVI has to have a Minnesota origin and it has to be issued by a Minnesota accredited veterinarian. So what this basically means, or a situation where hopefully I can get this to make a little bit more sense for you, is if you are working at a livestock concentration point, as an example, let's say you're at either a sale a county fair, a market, or something like that, the physical origin of that animal is that fair, that market, or that exhibition. It is not the place they came from prior to coming to the fair. It's the place they are currently at. So if you're at a sale for livestock and the animals are being sold, the origin of the animals is where you're standing at that sale. So it would be the address for the sale itself, not where the animals came from prior to coming to the sale. So it's the physical location you're at. If the consigner and the origin are the same, then both of those fields two and three do not need to be completed. If the origin address, however, is different, then box three that indicates where the animals are physically residing at that point, that does need to be completed. So if someone in South Dakota owns the animals, but they're standing at a clinic in Minnesota to be examined so that they can tour the state in the RV with their owners, then the physical address for those traveling animals could be the clinic where the animals are at at that time. Hopefully that is clear. So if, if they're in the RV and they're traveling along and they don't have a physical address in the state of Minnesota, you would be able to use your clinic address. The alternative is if you have people who are traveling or on vacation and they're living with temporarily or staying with relatives or at a campground, or anything like that, that address can also be used. But if there are situations where they're in an RV and there's actually no physical address, you would be able to use the clinic address. But we do commonly get health certificates returned to our office when they don't have a Minnesota address on that origin side. So you need to make sure there's always a physical address. And I'm stressing a physical address because PO boxes are not physical addresses. It needs to be where the animals are actually physically at. And then we'll move on to the right side of the health certificate, which is uh, something fairly similar. If the consignee and the consigner, for example, are the same, then that address might be the same on both sides. And that's most commonly going to happen in tra with traveling pets again, where they're moving around the country and they're not actually, there's no change of ownership. The consignee consigner is the same, but they want to be able to bring the animal to drive out to California in their RV. So in that situation, the destination address would need to be clear as to where the animal's ultimate destination is. 
and that ultimate destination could be a campground in California or whatever specific destination they have in mind. If they don't have a physical address for their destination, you would need to work with them to figure out what the ultimate plan is because it's very common for states to return a house certificate if it doesn't have a destination address as well. And this is, goes to show a little bit more about what I mentioned earlier. When there's no change of ownership, you will commonly see that boxes one and five are the same. So John Smith is traveling with his dog. Then John Smith would be the consigner and John Smith would be the consignee. If he lives here in St. Paul, then his St. Paul address would be in box two and his St. Paul address could also be in box six. However, if he's going to South Dakota with his hunting dog for the weekend, then the destination where he'll be staying in South Dakota would be what would go in box seven. So that would need to be some sort of destination address and the state of destination will always expect it to be a physical address, not just, you know, Fargo, North Dakota, but actually one, two, three, 150th Avenue in Fargo, North Dakota. They want a full physical address. And just a reminder that PO boxes are not physical addresses. So make sure that you are not using a PO box on a CVI for any of the physical address information where animals are going, are coming from or going to. We will also commonly get a lot of questions about this box. This is the certificate of the owner or agent. The Board of Animal Health does not ever require this box to be completed. At least it has not in the last 10 years. There's the possibility that given a specific disease situation, there could be a reason why we would want an owner or agent to sign off on a specific statement. But at this point, we do not require that. However, the state of destination might require an owner or agent to sign off on specific statements. So you would learn that by checking the state of destinations import requirements. An example of when I have seen that would be, um, I don't know if it's currently still required, but for a period I know North Dakota did require owners to sign off on specific statements related to swine being imported into North Dakota. I believe they were either related to PERS or PED statements. So if that is a requirement by the state of destination, then that field would need to be completed. However, if the state of destination does not require it, that that is not something you would need to worry about yourself, unless you particularly in, want your client to sign off on something. We don't have that requirement at the board. The official ID field is most commonly um, a field that we look at for livestock that's moving. Horses also require official ID. The horse official ID can typically or is often as simple as a thorough description of the horse. For other livestock, typically what's required is a USDA approved official identification ear tag. So the snippet that you see the image on the screen is the image from the homepage of our website. And if you click on that from our homepage, you would be able to see an outline of all of the official identification devices that are considered official by species. We do not have horses on there. Again, horses, typically a thorough description of the horse is often sufficient. But for other livestock, the official identification ear tags are required. For small animals, oftentimes people will put their microchip number in there name, a description, things like that. In addition to the official ID number itself, we still do require information on the animals, including age, sex, and breed. So make sure that all of the fields that are circled, the required fields that are noted, are completed on the CVI.
And as far as options go, as I already mentioned, this is the, the paper option. It's a poor part form. Just so you have in the back of your heads, because we are moving more and more towards digital capture of pretty much everything, we will likely be moving this to a three-part form the next time these go to print. So if you order these in the future and see there's only three pieces, that would be why. We no longer need a second form to submit to the state of destination since that's all done electronically now. And then there are several electronic CVI options that you can use as well. And the image on this screen shows where you can go, again, on our home page, where you can click to see a lot of information of electronic health certificates, what's available, and a whole bunch of helpful tools to help utilize those. One thing to note for eCVIs is we accept eCVIs only in their electronic format their original electronic format. So if you're using an eCVI and you print it out and mail it to our office, we don't consider that to be an acceptable CVI. Electronic CVIs and the, the advantages that we're trying to gain from utilizing electronic CVIs require our office to actually receive them in the electronic format. If, however, you are dealing with um, small animals in your clinic, and you have clients who are flying with pets, you should know that the copy that goes with the client should be printed when you're using an electronic CVI, and you'll want to sign that in ink with the digital signature. We've heard from various airlines, they do not accept digital signatures at the airport, so you want to make sure that you actually sign the paper copy the client goes to the airport with in ink. We do not need a copy of the ink signed CVI in our office. That is simply for the airline's requirements, not for the state of origin or destination. The Minnesota eCVI is a free electronic CVI option, and this is available through our office. Michael Herman in our office is the email contact listed and his telephone number is listed if you have an interest in learning more about this document. There are upsides and downsides to this. So this is, again, it's a desktop health certificate that uses Adobe Reader. So it's not usable on tablets or smartphones. It would only be used on an actual laptop or desktop computer. You can create templates with it, meaning if you have a client you see regularly, you could complete all of the information on the left side of the health certificate for that client that you see regularly. And you could also complete the bottom with all of the veterinary information. And you would be able to save that template somewhere on your computer so that each time you see that particular client, you could bring that same CVI up again and have it already partially completed to save a little bit of time in your office. The same would go if you have, you know, someone who they're commonly exporting animals to. You would also be able to fill out the consignee and destination information. So you would be able to fill out as much information as would be useful. And this would be for large and small animals. And then this CVI is actually submitted through email manually to our office. If you have desktop email, such as Outlook, you can automate it so that you can click to send the form and it will attach it to an email for you. If you have Gmail or something like that, you'd actually have to attach the form after it's been issued to the email and send it to our office and all of the information on where to send it and how to use this form, you would receive once you sign up to use this. This form does require a user agreement. And what that means is this, state, this form was made through the combined efforts of various states here in the U.S. And because so many states have put time and money into developing this form, and there are tools that have been created to capture this information electronically within various state databases. 
the user agreement ensures that no one takes the form and modifies fields to prevent the states from being able to automate the capture of the information that's on this form. So that basically outlines how the form is used and makes sure that no one actually changes the form. And again, you can call our office or check with Michael Herman directly to learn more about this, or you can visit our eCVI page, which again, I'll show you when we're done here. The MCVI is an application which is at this time also free. It's available on iOS and Android smartphones and tablets. It can be used online or offline. And you can utilize the phone or tablet contact list to import addresses to consignee and consigner fields within the app. In order to utilize this, all you need to do is download the MCVI app on your device, and then you'll create an account, making sure that the state of Minnesota is listed, and then click on create an account. And then that request comes to our office, and we can verify that the request was made by an accredited veterinarian and approve the account. And then you'll be set up to use that to issue health, to issue health certificates or CVIs in your office. The thing to be aware of when utilizing this app is if you are offline using this in the country somewhere where you don't currently have service, you do need to make sure that once you're back and able to connect to Wi-Fi, that you open the app back up. Opening the app back up is what allows the CVIs that you've issued to automatically send to our office. If the app is not opened back up, then the CVIs will stay in the app until it's connected to Wi-Fi and the app is opened. So you'll want to make sure and do that at least at minimum every seven days to make sure those CVIs do get to our office within the right time period. Another thing to be aware of is there is a template available if you're dealing with livestock, which have a lot of unique animal identifiers such as official ID, breed, sex, age information, there's a template available to try to capture that and upload it directly into the app to populate the individual animal records. And again, Michael Herman helps to support this. So if you have questions on that, he can help walk you through that. And there's some more, again, helpful tools on our website as to how to use this. So th this, along with the previous desktop app that I mentioned, are both free and supported by the state. USDA VSPS is a federal eCVI. This is also free. This is a USDA website. So this is not state supported, meaning if you have problems with this, our office wouldn't be able to help. You would need to contact USDA directly to try to figure out or work through any bugs or concerns with this. But they also allow veterinarians to build templates, which they can save within the internet, within their account, and then they can use that to populate specific clients that they might see regularly. And they also have the way to upload a spreadsheet with individual animal information to populate that, which can be really helpful. And to create an account, I entered in the, the web address there so you could see where to go to for that. And I believe you guys have a copy of the slide. So if, if you have any questions, again, that is also um, listed on our website with more information. Global VetLink is a private company, so all the support is done for that eCVI through Global VetLink. That is another one that auto-submits, so you don't have to do anything specifically in order to submit that document. And the contact information for that company is also on our website. VetSentry is another private company that has a official CVI that's approved here in Minnesota. It also will auto-submit the CVI for you, so you don't have to worry about that. And any fees or anything, you would need to contact them to, to learn more about that. The APHIS Form 7001, want to make sure to bring this up because there's commonly a lot of confusion on this. We have, this form has not been approved as a CVI for interstate use in Minnesota for more than a decade. This form is available for download by anyone on the web online, which is partly why it's not approved as an official form. 
As I mentioned earlier, CVIs are only available to accredited veterinarians here in Minnesota. Since this form is available to you, your clients, your grandma, and your kids, <laughs> it is not an official CVI. You can use this and should, I apologize, I don't know if you can hear that ringing. Um, that's from the phone that I'm speaking on, so I'm not sure how to turn it off, but um, this form is, again, it's available to anyone. So since CVIs can only be used by accredited veterinarians, we cannot authorize use of this form because it's too easy for it to be used fraudulently. So if you are exporting animals internationally and are required to use this form for that purpose, there's no problem with that. You would be able to use whatever form the USDA would dictate that you use for international exports. However, if you're, if you're utilizing a form for either movement within Minnesota, if a client wants to get health certificates, for example, if they're selling a high value animal within the state, or if a client needs a health certificate to export animals to another state, you would have to use only official forms this would not be included for intra or interstate use as an official form. And a lot of states in the country do not accept this for import either, just so you know. So not only do we not accept it um, for Minnesota accredited veterinarians to use, but a lot of states don't accept it for import. So this is just a reminder, this is, this is not new. This, is, this form has not been approved for more than a decade, as, again, as I mentioned, but just a reminder to not use this form for interstate use or intrastate use. CVI ad, um, addendum. So we have an addendum policy for imported animals that we've outlined for veterinarians who find it easier to export information from some sort of existing database instead of including the animals on the health certificate itself. This is commonly comes up with dairy practitioners where their clients might have dairy comp and they can easily export all of the animals that are going to be moved onto a spreadsheet type file. It's not ideal because it's harder to capture the information when it's not included on the CVI itself. However, we have made um, arrangements to try to help veterinarians make it easier to include animals on an addendum if they can't get the information auto-uploaded onto a CVI. So the desktop PDF, for example, the Minnesota eCVI, there's no way to import animals into that. They have to be entered manually. So in those situations, sometimes people will use this addendum to try to make things easier. If you have any questions on that, again, if you're looking at eCVI options, we have um, Michael in our office as well as myself that can help you walk through any of those options and how to make things easiest for your clinic. And how do you get the health certificate? So you can call our main line with a request and you'll be routed to a staff member who can take your order. Um, and I will also show you the website here in just a moment when we're finished. Otherwise, the MCVI app you can just download that and that'll automatically make a request to our office to open up an account for you. The eCVI or desktop PDF, Michael Herman is a contact for that. And then for any of the private companies or the federal USDA VSPS eCVI, you would contact those groups individually to figure out how to access their eCVI options as well as to set up an account. And then you can see the paper online request. And I'm going to exit out of the presentation for just a moment here to show you the website so you can see. So if you go to your browser and just search the Minnesota Board of Animal Health, it'll be easy enough for us to come up and this is our homepage. If you look under veterinarians on the lower left here, you can see that there's the paper CVI order. So if you want to order paper CVIs, you can click on that, fill out the form, and that'll automatically come to our office. Of course, you can call our office as well. If you want to know about electronic health certificates options, there's this electronic certificate 
information and it covers all of the approved CVIs as well as has YouTube videos and other helpful documents to help kind of merge your way into moving more towards electronic documents. And we also have, again, someone in the office to help through that. And then this is the other link I mentioned earlier for official identification. So if you click on that, it'll outline official identification for every species. And you'll be able to see what information is listed on there. So there's a ton of information on our website if you ever have any questions. And I did have a few extra slides in here that were more specific for large animal veterinarians. So I'll, I'll leave those on there. But first, I'd like to pause to make sure that we don't have questions, to make sure any questions are addressed before I get to any of the uh, extra slides. As of right now, we currently do not have any questions. All right, well, maybe I'll cover a couple of the extra slides just in case, and then feel free to stop me at any point if there are additional questions. Does that, does that work for you, Nicole? Yes, that works for me. All right. Um, a, a couple other things that I should mention. Sometimes you guys might get a letter from our office, likely with my name on it, if you've gotten a disapproved CVI. And just so you know how that piece works, if a state of destination disapproves a CVI because it didn't meet import requirements, those CVIs first come back to our office and we are requested to forward them on to you. <clears throat> so we will forward you a letter that says that the CVI was disapproved and to look for the information from the state of destination, which we included with the letter, to outline if anything needs to be done. Typically, that information is kind of an FYI, so you know for the future. Every once in a while, a state will ask, a state of destination will ask for follow-up, and if that's the case, it will indicate that in the letter from the state of destination. So just make sure and try to take a peek at those when you get them, so at least you're aware of where any issues might be. You can also call our office and find out um, if you have questions on how to understand that, or call the state of destination, of course, directly if it's a return from them to verify any questions you might have about future movements to that state. One other thing I want to mention um, completely off the subject is the Board of Animal Health will be hiring for another senior veterinarian at some point in the future. So if anyone has interest in that, keep that in the back of your head. All applications need to go through the state website, but keep an eye out for that if you have interest in um, an alternative job path. So really quickly, I just wanted to uh, mention a few things. Again, this is going to be helpful for livestock accredited veterinarians. We are still sending out USDA metal tags, both the silver tags and the orange bangs vaccination tags for free from our office. This will be limited as USDA is looking at discontinuing the use of all visual official identification ear tags in livestock, or at least in cattle at this point, and moving towards RFID ear tags. However, until that decision is confirmed, these tags are still free from our office. But I wanted you guys to be aware that that might be changing in the future and that there is thoughts from USDA that we will finally be moving towards RFID tags for livestock. And also for any livestock that are identified with official identification through your clinic when you're receiving these tags, if those are animals are being identified on paperwork, so if that's captured on a health certificate or a test chart or vaccination record, then those records work perfectly fine to capture the information that's required by rule that you need to capture when applying official ID. And we can capture all of that here in our office when we get the records. 
However, if you are not issuing a test chart, a vaccination record, or a health certificate when applying official ID for a client, you would want to make sure somewhere in your records that you're documenting what tags that you're applying to the animals, what kind of animals they are, when you're applying them, and where you're applying them. So this is just kind of a heads up on some of that, since oftentimes this goes along with CVI, since these tags are, are often applied before an animal movement. I wanted to make sure to mention that. And also, if you have clients that need official ID, but you're not applying it yourself, you can give out official identification tags to clients, but you would want to make sure and track the tags that you're giving them, when you gave them, and where to whom you gave them to, including the entire number of the tags that you're giving them. So if you're giving them 100 tags, make sure you know what 100 tags they were given, when, and again, to whom you gave them. And make sure and document that in your records so you have that. And this is not specific to accredited veterinarians, but I thought it would be just a helpful FYI for livestock veterinarians who are on the farm to make sure they're aware that clients of yours are also um, under a regulation to be able to keep records for their livestock. So this is an example of cattle records that are required, and they have to keep records for five years of all animals they buy and sell. And what when this is most helpful for our accredited veterinarians, if they know that someone's having a farm dispersal sale or they know that they're going to be selling animals at some point, just as an FYI reminder to them to make sure that they're keeping whatever records they need to keep on those animals before they sell them. Or if you know that they're getting animals in from another farm, whether that be in Minnesota or out of state, a reminder that they should be getting those animals with health certificates and that they should be also documenting that information in their records as to when they got those animals and from where. All right, so that was just a few other FYIs. Are there any questions at this point? Well, we currently do not have uh, any more questions coming in at this point in time. Um, while people may, if they do have a chance, I know some people don't type as fast as others, so I'll give you a few uh, more minutes, but I just want to uh, remind everybody that um, I'll be emailing you a link to the evaluation shortly, and we greatly appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to fill it out. Um, I'll also be sending you your CE certificate of attendance. I will reattach the PowerPoint slides. I know not everyone got them because um, you might have registered after I sent them out. And I will also include the cheat sheet um, that was referenced earlier in the presentation. Um, Dr. Schwabender, do you have any other <laughs> questions? Sorry, I just slaughtered your name there. No, do that's all right. Any other uh, comments or information you'd like to pass along? Um, if, if anything was confusing or, or you need it to go over it again, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. Give me a call or drop me an email, and I'm more than happy to um, touch base on any questions that you may have. Great. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, we still do not have any questions. So I would like to thank everyone for their time today and attending, and we hope you found this information useful. Have a great day. All right, thank you.